All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I see no one in the hall, so that's usually a good sign that things are beginning. And I think there's a power light on on the camera, so we're good to go. My name is Christine Norville. I teach at Regent Preparatory in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just about a three and a half hour drive. I'm in my 11th year teaching in the high school. I was hired when we decided, let's add a grade and just see if it happens. And at the end of that year, they said, well, we may not have a sophomore class, so we'll see if you have a job. We'll see if people re-enroll, and they did. And four years later, we graduated our first class of five students, and then we had seven, and then we had four, and then we had 10. And we've, <laughs> we've continued to grow, and this year we're gonna graduate 26, oh. which is our largest ever. So we're very excited about that and actually thrilled because it really is on a hope and a prayer that you hope the high school actually takes, that it actually happens. And so I've also been on a journey just as um, a classical parent because this is my 19th year um, with classical education. My first two have graduated high school at our school and our youngest is homeschooled and is a junior in high school. So I feel f from a, a few different points of experience um, there's, there's a lot there that I've experienced and had to learn along the way, and I'm very much still in the process of learning. I always feel that. So I want to talk to you today about nested tails. And nested tails is sort of an unusual term. Um, some people have heard the word. Anybody heard the word before? Have you heard that? Nested stories, nested tales. You've actually read lots of them. You just didn't know that there was a name for it. It's, it's something I'd probably tell you. So I'm going to start um, with a little bit of background from G.K. Chesterton, who talks about the need for story, but how story really awakens us from the familiar, especially when routine and habit take over. Story can sometimes shock us or wake us up to something whether it's the sense of wonder, if you've read the ethics of Elfland, which a lot of people refer to from his book Orthodoxy or not, there is something to it. So I'm going to begin with a few examples, but I also want to explain that uh, very simply, just so that you have a definition. A nested story is another literal known story that is embedded within a story that you're reading. It's already there. So. We're, our very first example is going to be one from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, where Washington Irving embeds the headless horseman. So that legend, that superstition, is a nested tale. So does that, that definition make sense? All right, so what I, I want to distinguish this from is many times when we're teaching fiction or poetry or even reading through a chapter of history and working through material, many times we'll stop and tell our own story or some personal experience that connects to a thought or an idea, that is not what I'm talking about. We are talking about nested stories, which is different. And it's true that applied truth um, in that moment of epiphany, or you can tell when a student is like, oh, oh, I remember this. This is, this is the idea that you're talking about in the story, right? That, that is a very different experience, and it's obviously um, necessary for us to learn and to apply what we're actually learning, but nested stories are just a little bit different. And if we talk about and work toward nesting stories and what we teach, it actually takes more preparation on our part. So we're gonna work up to the work of it, I guess you could say. Um, nested stories are like the picture John Milton Gregory describes in Law 5 about the teaching process. He says, and I quote, there come occasions when the teacher may turn lecturer or preacher from the stores of his own riper studies and give his class, their students, broader, richer, and clearer views of the field of their work. He may for a little lift the child to his own strong shoulders to give it a clearer view of the path he has traveled. And I do believe that Gregory was talking about life experience, but I also feel that what I'm mentioning today can also help. So the first book, and if anybody ever gets excited when you see teachers walk in with books, it would be this type of group. I have a stack. I have a book stack right here. Um, I read this in the fall when it came out in November of this year from Ignatius Press. Um, most people are familiar with Peter Kreeft. I, I first read him in, in graduate school a few years ago. Um, he has a summa of the summa for Thomas Aquinas. <laughs> 
even though it's still three inches. <laughs> Anybody? Re uh, okay. So he wrote this tiny little book, which is unusual for him, and it's called Doors in the Walls of the World, Signs of Transcendence in a Human Story. And it, it's there on your um, handout right there. But he talks about, as a philosopher, how our life story, or his story, as we've heard before in biblical teaching, that the idea that we are character, and we have a setting, and we have a plot, and we have conflict, and then there is a resolution at the end, that all of that is part of life experience. And so he uses some really unusual examples, but one of the ways he approaches life philosophy through the metaphor of story is he talks about the crooked and the straight line. And um, I have it written down here on your handout for you. He says, we have crooked and straight lines in our own stories, and so does every bit of history and fiction and nonfiction that we read. So following a straight line is following the logical A to B to C. This is what happens in the story. He said, that's a straight line. However, the crooked line is what we experience innately. It is the intuition, the implications, sort of the layer below the surface. Those are the crooked lines. And he says, these are things we sense, meaning we know them in a different way than just understanding the literal words of a story. More importantly, he argues this is a metaphor for our lives. He says the divine storyteller is telling our human story. God is telling our human story by writing straight with crooked lines. Which I just, I love that idea. God is writing our story. He's writing straight, but with crooked lines. How's that for a thought? That's his introduction before he launches into the book, which is really unique and not for the faint of heart. So, what I want to mention is that uh, nested tales have an ability to deepen what you're teaching without you actually saying your point. It's a moment where we invite our students to come to uh, realization, hopefully, on their own. We can still tell them if anyone feels lost, but um, we can use it for different purposes. So I have for you just a few examples. I already mentioned Irving. Um, so I was going to read a little bit from him. I don't know if anyone has. I lost my dust jacket. This is Washington Irving's sketchbook. It was a 1980 reproduction, and it has, from the year 18. 50. It has a lot of the original illustrations. If you've read Washington Irving, he's not a complicated writer in any way, but um, the beauty of how he says things, and just because it's easy to read. Um, he's really fun to read as well. So I wanted to share a little bit from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. So how many of you know Sleepy Hollow, either through your own education or how many of you teach it? Anyone teach it in any middle grade or high school both? It can go in a lot of places. So the place of Sleepy Hollow is actually introduced as one of the quietest places in the whole world where a soft brook and whispering animals dwell under a drowsy, dreamy influence. That's Sleepy Hollow, right? But there, early in the story, the calm is interrupted by Irving's own insertion of witchcraft, superstitions, Indian powers there in the Hudson River Valley. It's an influence that has some effect upon the people who live there. He describes the most famous legend of the figure on horseback without a head, and it seems that everyone who lives there has imbibed, he says, the witching influence. And it begins to grow, the story begins to grow more imaginative in that moment, and people dream dreams and they think they see apparitions. So I was going to read just a little bit from how he words it himself. There's so much that I could tell you. Just for a little bit more of the mood here. The dominant spirit, however, that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head. It is said by some to be the ghost of a Hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the Revolutionary War and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind. His haunts are not confined to the valley, but extend at times to the adjacent roads and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance. Indeed, certain of the most authentic historians of those parts 
who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this specter, allege that the body of the trooper, having been buried in the churchyard, the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head. He goes on, he really paints a wonderful mood. Whenever you hear the wind howling at night, it's because the ghost has just ridden by in a flash. You know, and he continues, but he intentionally puts the story there. So why? I mentioned mood. Why else would he throw the story in if it's the legend of Sleepy Hollow? Why would he put another story in it? Can you think, those of you who know the story, what are other purposes? What do we get to? Why does he throw it in there? Can you think of anything? We want the mood. We want anybody? Know what happens? Yes. Why did he throw it in here? What's going to happen? A little suspense. Yes. But I'm more off the, as far as authentic, as far as the, the main story being authentic with this other, just adding another layer. To it. Right. So it can build upon it as well, and so that that's one example. So let me go to a little bit of nonfiction. Does anyone teach a history class in here? Any history teachers? Only literary? Yes. Oh, one section. <laughs> We're here. <clears throat> I want. I don't. I have it on my phone because I have it on my Kindle app. But you can find it for free. Um, a tour on the prairies by Irving. It is when he was 50. He decided to tour Indian Territory, Oklahoma Territory, for one month. And uh, he has a very eclectic group of people he ran into overseas, and they decide to come do this and hire a guide and everything. And so um, it's real. It's like a memoir. It's just a 30-day memoir. But he still, Irving embeds a story even in his real-life account. So um, specifically, I'll mention this. One of the men that they hired is hired to be a hunter to provide food and game. His name is Pierre Beat. And if you read his description, he sounds very much like Natty Bumpo of James Fenimore Cooper's uh, character creation. And so uh, even, I'll just quote this, he's, he's like the noble savage. Irving writes, his features were not bad, being shaped not unlike those of Napoleon, but sharpened up with high Indian cheekbones. And he, he goes on. But Beat was hunter and also translator for them, depending upon which of the three tribes they do encounter in the 30 days they're out on this trip. And Beat actually passed along to Irving an Indian romance. And I, I could read it to you, but it'd probably take too much time. But it centers on a young Indian hunter who's betrothed to his Osage maiden. He returns to camp after some weeks, only to find the camp abandoned and his fiance nowhere to be found. And we find out that she had actually passed away and he actually only saw her ghost and it's a really sad tragic story and Irving includes it at the very end of the book because at that moment in the book Irving honestly admits that they are starving they've run out of all of their supplies and they're not close enough to Fort Smith yet and yes the Fort Smith that many of you know so um, I think he did it very intentionally of course you put the tragic tale in right at the end when you yourselves and your whole group of people and your animals, everyone's starting to starve. But then they make it to their safe destination. So it's used in nonfiction as well, is my point. So I do want to mention then, let's just skip a little along into the 1800s. Um, fabulous new editions by translator David Jack. Do any of you read or have read George MacDonald? Yes, 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 okay. Uh, you may not have read Castle Warlock. It's not one of his most famous. But David Jack um, does live in Edinburgh, and he is in the process of, I think he's on the fourth book. And these are available on Amazon, and they're all uniquely um, illustrated, and the covers are amazing. But I wanted to, um, when I read this this summer when it first came out, McDonald embeds stories in an insane manner. There are so many kinds. And I wanted to be sure that I show you how, like, how far you can go. It takes an incredible effort, I think, to know how to do it well. So um, the first McDonald book I'll mention is one that's a little bit more simplistic. So especially in case you're not um, used to hearing about him or not really well read in all the things that he wrote, because he was a poet and a minister. He wrote nonfiction, lots of fiction. And many of his characters are actually ministers. 
And so um, the example I wanted to use first is pretty simple. It's from Annals of a Quiet Neighborhood. You can find that free online as well. And our lead character is Vicar Harry Walton, and he's been posted to a new parish. It's a little rural, a little remote. The name of the village is Marshmallows. <laughs> Marshmallows, I know. It's not real, by the way. But <laughs> it's not a real place in England, in case you look it up. Um, the story is replete with stereotypical characters like the rich old widow who manipulates others through her position, an old geezer who works the local mill, the young working class couple separated by a gruff father, and so on. What's unique is Walton, the vicar, his perspective as narrator, he is truly learning to see each parishioner as they are, and his ideals are clear. Through his eyes and ears, we meet each person, we see his encounters, we hear his sermons. There are many sermons that are separate chapters throughout the book. He literally has several chapters titled, What I Preached, <laughs> and then it has the entire message. So if you didn't know Christ and you pick up one of his novels, you may not know what you've read, but you'll hear it soon enough. So the sermons are sort of nested into the story very naturally, and they come very easily, and you, you know it's George MacDonald preaching. And so that's also an example of a nested tale. Each sermon hap happens to have its own point and reference, and you truly can follow along as if you're at the church. And that's one of the effects. But in Castle Warlock, this particular book, um, and if you're not familiar, sometimes when you translate things from a Scottish brogue in different dialects, depending on where you're at, what David Jack has done, let me find a clear example, is whenever there's dialogue that's really complicated, and I can't even pretend to pronounce Scottish dialogue, he'll break it into two sides. So you'll see the original on the left and then the easily understood English on the right. But then when MacDonald goes back to um, the regular story, and it's no longer brogue dialect, then you have just across the page, it goes back to the English that we do know, if that makes sense. So if you don't know um, the story, um, it's actually a ghost story. So similar a little bit, I suppose, in my choice from Washington Irving. But Castle Warlock is a literal place, and it is where our lead characters actually live. Um, it's named for uh, the long-dead captain who is said to have plundered other ships during a career as a pirate. And there's a legend that there's wealth buried at the castle. But unfortunately, our Laird and uh, young Cosmo, his son, have no idea where the money is, and they're running out of money. So they have been struggling for years throughout the story. It begins early when I think Cosmo's like seven or eight, and it continues into his 20s. But they've been struggling against the state's steady decline. We, the readers, are made to feel that a man can have very few material possessions and yet be one of the heirs of all things in the way that the father talks to his son. There's very much a spiritual mentorship there, and you realize that materialism is such a, why, why, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't even matter if we're running out of food. So through the stories of people who visit the castle or accidentally run into the castle because of bad weather, which happens a lot, apparently, where they're at in Scotland, if you read the story, um, the Laird's lessons, his little interruptions and moral tales to his son. Um, even the stories of genealogy are written as a separate story that someone will launch into, and then it's reproduced into the, the plot of the story itself. But also, just to add a little more flavor, in the fourth category, if you had to put it in one, MacDonald adds uh, a few of the tales from the old land in the old days by an old servant. She's in her 80s. Her name is Grizzy Grant. She sounds grizzly, if that makes sense. But Grizzy has a heavy, heavy dialect, which if you try to read the original, it sounds guttural and phonetic and bizarre. And you're like, what word is that? I'm so glad I have a translation. But um, I wanted to tell you one story and read. I just condensed a little bit of her story that she tells um, the father and son. They have been sick. It's in the middle of winter. They've been sick for weeks with a, what sounds like pneumonia. And so she comes in, and she tells a lowland tale of a man and his wife who have each seen all of their children die, except they have one left. And she continues to tell them the story by the bedside. And you're like, you're trying to comfort them. Are you telling <laughs> stories of people dying? But when the last boy is old enough, old enough to set out on his own, he unexpectedly takes sick and dies. And the, the husband and wife, the mother and father, are grief-stricken. So on the stormy night, the night before the funeral of their youngest son, 
a friendly stranger comes to the door to ask for a lamb to feed the mourners at the wake. And the grieving father says, nay, why should I give my last one again? The stranger held there right at the front of the door and said that all of his sheep, all of them have cried and bleated when he has taken the best lamb, but he calls those sheep ungrateful. The sad father simply lowered his head and began to weep. But when he looked up again to continue the conversation, the stranger has disappeared. So he comes back in and speaks to his wife. And she said, I, I don't know if that was a human. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to go get my last lamb. I think we will feed the people well. And for whatever reason, and there's not a lot more to the story, for whatever reason, he's now at peace. And Grizzy, the old servant, as she's telling the story to them, she encourages them and launches into a tiny mini-sermon after that about the fact that God will provide for them no matter what and that she trusts that they will be made well and they will no longer be sick. And they do recover. They've been sick for weeks, but they do recover. And she just encourages them to seek God for his provision. So McDonald then really does a fine job of using all kinds of categories of nested tales. So, I wanted to give you just two more examples of different ways um, that we can embed tales that are already well known. And so on your outline, I've just listed for you um, the story types. The, this is very basic, nothing complicated here. Parables from any culture, particularly biblical, are easy to use. Um, fables, I brought along a copy of Aesop. And then also fairy tales, all types work really well um, and the different types of things that we might teach in various grades. So I wanted to give at least one example from middle grade fiction, if you want to call it as a category. It is a younger read or chapter, it's a little above chapter books. So are you familiar with the Giver series by Lois Lowry? Do any of you happen to teach one of those books out of the four? They're actually a loose collection if you're not familiar with them. So The Giver was made into a movie a few years ago, which brought it more, I guess, mainstream so people would read the book. But Lois Lowry has won multiple awards as a children's writer, both historical fiction and all kinds of things. But um, this is the second book. This one is called Gathering Blue. And then I think the third one is The Messenger. And the fourth one is Sun, just S-O-N, Sun. And these stories take place in a future Earth, but some cat catastrophe has happened, so they're really categorized as a dystopia, and everything has reverted to um, probably before medieval, more of the Dark Ages feel. And so um, then if you're not familiar with it, let me just read a little bit to you from it and also just tell you a little more about the story and how I would nest something into it should I be teaching this. I don't teach middle school anymore, so it's not quite in the same age I'm teaching at the moment, but it's still just a perfect example. Um, so our lead character, her name is Kira, K-I-R-A, and she's just lost her mother, the only parent that she's ever known, and she's clearly a cripple. There's something wrong with one of her legs. And so let me just read her own words. So her mother has passed, and she is recalling a conversation that she remembers very clearly. No one would desire Kira. No one ever had except her mother. Often Katrina had told Kira the story of her birth, the birth of a fatherless girl with a twisted leg and how her mother had fought to keep her alive. They came to take you, Katrina said, whispering the story to her in the evening in her cot, with a fire fed and glowing. You were one day old, not yet named your one-syllable infant name. Kira. Yes, that's right. Kira, they brought me food, and they were going to take you away to the field. Kira shuddered. It was the way. It was the custom. It was the merciful thing to give an unnamed and perfect infant back to the earth before its spirit had filled it and made it human. But it made her shudder. Katrina stroked her daughter's hair. They meant no harm. Kira nodded. They didn't know it was me. It wasn't you. Yet. Tell me again why you told them no, Kira whispered. Her, mo her mother sighed, remembering. I knew I would not have another child. Perhaps they would have given me one eventually, an orphan to raise. But as I held you, even then, with your spirit not yet arrived and with your leg bent wrong so that it was clear you would not ever run, even then your eyes were bright. 
I could see the beginning of something remarkable in your eyes, and your fingers were long and well-shaped. And strong. My fingers were strong, Kira added with satisfaction. She had heard the story so often, each time of hearing. She looked down at her strong hands with pride. The story continues, but um, obviously, without much work at all, we can tell there's biblical parallels, right? So what comes to mind when you just hear that two-page description? What could I use from scripture? What could I insert, do you think? Fearfully and wonderfully made. How about any parables or something that Jesus happened to narrate when he's with the crowds? Anything come to mind? Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus and what? Oh, Zacchaeus. Yeah. Uh, uh, what were you going to say, though? Oh, I was, I was going to say that he elevated children. Yes. He was pleased. Right. That, too. That would be a perfect fit for that. I actually thought of Zacchaeus as well. So, um, Kira is allowed to live, instead of being banished, basically, you would have just been starved, banished, eaten by wolves, whatever. She would be out on her own and thrown out um, simply because she is not whole or she is imperfect. So they will not cast her out because they found out that she has a gift. And this particular gift is something they can't explain, but the village knows that they need it. And so gathering blue, the title itself, is about gathering a color, gathering flowers, to literally boil them down to create a blue ink and a blue dye to color the threads of the yarn of what it is that Kira begins to weave. So she has the skill to weave. So let me just read. I love the way Lowry says it. And I know some of you are going to go, how could I not have read a sixth grade book before? But <laughs> it, it's beautiful. Um, this is still early in the book. It says, with her thumb, Kira felt a small square of decorated woven cloth she had forgotten the strip of cloth in the recent confusing days since her mother had passed. But she remembered this one, this design. It had come and bidden to her hands as she sat beside her mother in the last days. When she was much younger, the knowledge had come quite unexpectedly to her, and she recalled the look of amazement on her mother's face as she watched Kira choose and pattern the threads one afternoon with a sudden sureness. I didn't teach you that. Her mother said, laughing with delight and astonishment. I wouldn't know how. Kira hadn't known how either, not really. It had come about almost magically as if the threads had spoken to her or sung. And after that first time, the knowledge continued to grow. So the gift actually keeps her alive. And there's much more to the story. But I'm going to leave you hanging because Zacchaeus, it's perfect to actually stop a story midstream or maybe even before you read the chapter in class, what if you just read Luke 19 and just read a little bit about what Christ actually did? So uh, here's my paraphrased, or my students will say, it's the Norval version, or Norval notes as they call it. But um, when Jesus was entering Jericho, he saw Zacchaeus in the tree. He called him out by name. There was no reason for him to actually know Zacchaeus' name. I doubt he said to one of the disciples, hey, here's that guy in the tree. Um, but he knew his name, and Zacchaeus welcomed him regardless of what the people said about him as a tax collector, of course, and he caught a glimpse, I think, of who he was in Christ's eyes, especially just being called out like that, like, you know me? You found me worthy to be known? I mean, what is that? And immediately it changes Zacchaeus' heart, and he says, look, Lord, I will give back half of my possessions to the poor, if I've cheated anyone, I'll pay them back four times. And no one had to tell him the right thing to do. He just knew he was changed. So what if I read Zacchaeus first, and all I simply said was, we're going to read the story of Zacchaeus so it's fresh on your mind, and then we'll go ahead and transition to reading what we're going to read today in class. But I don't stop after reading Zacchaeus and say, this is what you should look for. What's the moral of the story? What should you learn today in your own heart? I don't stop and give that. I just simply read it, and then I read the chapter we were going to read in Gathering Blue. What do you think will happen when we're done reading the fiction chapter after that? If I just open the class for discussion and ask my students to think about, why did we read Zacchaeus? 
How does that connect to Kira and what you know so far early in this story? What do you think they might say? What kinds of things would they come up with? And for most of you, Gathering Blue was new, if I, if I caught that right. So what do you think they might come up with? Anybody? Can you give me, offer a suggestion? There was some words in there. They had words. OK, they had words. Zacchaeus had words. He didn't think he did, but right. he did. Yes. And did you notice, I didn't go into this, but uh, Kira said, I was given my one syllable name. There's more in the story to it. She was called Kira first. And then when she was a little older, she was called Kira. And then it's supposed to extend. And there's, there's more to how the naming works in their Dark Ages village, I suppose. What else do you think the students might come up with? You look like you're about to say something. Well, I don't know. Okay. I do wonder if Christ knows us by name. He just sees you and he just says your name. What that does to you. And for Kira to think she was about to be banished and then she's recognized by the village as valuable and come move into the village. We need your gift. And there's a little bit of manipulation in the story. I mean, they needed it for something else. They sort of were using her. But she was seen as valuable for the time, and it shifts the story entirely, where she thought she was worthless. So I, I can see a, a number of co conversations coming about. But there's something about when we don't tell the students, oh, hey, this is what you should be looking for. I want them to come to, um, it doesn't have to be an epiphany, but come to that realization, that learning on their own without being told by us, which I think a lot of times we, we tend to do because we just want to. <laughs> Because I do know about this, and I do know where I want you to go, and I do know what I want you to think, so I'm going to tell you. But if we can hold back just a little bit and use another story to somehow connect the dots and let them make sense of it in the way that they will, I think there's definitely a value to that. All right, so the last examples I have are from Aesop's Fables, and then also a few fairy tales, and then we're probably out of time. But for many years, I taught... Um, our freshmen are ancient literature, and we do Romeo and Juliet in the fall. Does anyone here teach Romeo and Juliet? But you know the story? <laughs> okay, so early in Act 1, um, because Romeo is moping about, because Rosaline does not return his love, and he's, oh, he's just a mess. And his cousin Benvolio comes along and says, hey, listen, your mom and dad want to know what's up with you. I'm going to get you out of this malaise and this depression and despair. And at that moment, one of the Capulet servants who can't read comes up and says, hey, can you read this party invitation? I'm supposed to go tell them to come to the party tonight at the Capulets. Romeo is a Montague, but they just play along. Oh, sure, we'll read it for you. And that's how Romeo and Benvolio and a whole group of them get into the Capulets party that night. And that's the moment when Romeo sees Juliet forget Rosaline and all that comes. But in the middle of Act 1, you're introduced to a very, very long, complicated monologue by their friend Mercutio. He's a comic character. And the context and the time period is everything to really understanding what Mercutio is getting at, because he has a darkness to it, and yet he's dancing around in the streets before they're making their way over to the Capulets party. And he just has something to him. So what? I would do is I would read, before we would read scene four, I'd say, oh, let me stop a moment. Let me read a two-sentence fable from Aesop for you, just, just so that you have this in your mind. So here is the monkey and the camel. I think every high school teacher, secondary teacher, needs your own copy of Aesop. If you don't have it, you'd be surprised how just as easy as chapter and verse from the Bible, they come in handy. But um, here it is, short and sweet. At a great meeting of the beast, the monkey stood up to dance, and his performance delighted all those present so much that they honored him with great applause. This praise infuriated the envious camel, who stood and tried to show up the monkey with his own dancing, but the camel made such a fool of himself that the beast shook their heads and drove him out of their meeting with jeers and laughter. The monkey danced well, the camel. Does a camel dance? Could a camel dance? It's the idea of it, right? It's so silly. He didn't do well. He made a fool of himself. 
and I just read that story. I usually read a fable two to three times in a row. I'm like, just listen. Now listen one more time. I want to be sure it's in your mind's eye before we read the scene. And then we'll read Mercutio. And then I'll say, what do we make of Mercutio? And they understand um, that he's a fool. But he's a fool many times in what they make fun of and what they parody. There's an element of truth. There's like a zing of truth and good parody. Think Saturday Night Live, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> sometimes it's a bit harsh, but yes, it's there. All right, one more for your listening pleasure. Um, I have also in the past, I used to teach Oliver Twist in eighth grade. Um, and even though it's a longer novel, the types of characters, it's a little more approachable. You, uh, in our school, we do Christmas Carol in fifth or sixth grade. And then another Dickens then, and we do Tale of Two Cities junior year. So they get a little sampling of Dickens through their short educational years. But um, I've also read The Fox and um, The Fox and the Crow during Oliver Twist. And that's the one where the crow has cheese in his mouth. And he's sitting up there and he's about to eat it, and the fox comes along and wants the cheese. Do you, anybody remember this? And so the fox, and I'll read it to my students too, just verbatim. But, the fox starts um, praising the crow for his beautiful black plumage and aren't you wonderful? And I bet your voice matches your beauty. Would you please sing for me? And of course the crow opens her mouth and <laughs> cheese drops and the fox takes it and runs off. And they're like, yes. <laughs> um, there's a lot of wonderful uh, thievery and pickpocket scenes and Oliver Twist and very much the ability to praise and flatter someone to get something else. Um, as part of many chapters in that particular book. So I've used that one too. So, but fairy tales, it's the last one. Um, also 2018, if you haven't seen this, published by Circe Institute, Tales of Wonder. It has um, eight story tales, and they say it's volume one. They're going to come up with more. But it has discussion questions built in, because these are all longer stories, and fairy tales take a commitment. Like if I'm going to embed a story in something I'm teaching for a fairy tale, I might assign the fairy tale the night before. And then as we read something in class, I'll stop and say, now, since you reread Beauty and the Beast, or this version of Beauty and the Beast, not the Disney one, which, which truth or which element do you, I know, it's hard. I know, I reread Beauty and the Beast several times now, and I'm like, this is very, very different from the movie, or even the music.